Okay, hello everyone. My name is Cody Baker. I'm a third year student in the Department of Applied and Computational Mathematics and Statistics, and I study computational neuroscience. In particular, the problem of inferring neuronal network structure, uh, specifically with data coming from extracellular recording techniques. So before we start to talk about results, we have to do a little bit of uh, background in neuroscience and the models that we use. And you don't have to know too much, but you do have to know that the brain is an organ comprised of very large numbers of individual computing units, cells known as neurons. And neurons are able to connect to one another uh, by way of a synapse, which is when the axon extension of one neuron attaches to the dendrites of another. And they share information across this synapse by way of electrochemical impulses known as spikes. These are brief transients observable via voltage traces from the inside of a neuron. Uh, you see the spikes are the two big events there, uh, and they decay very quickly down back to the resting potential. Now, neurons come in two types, excitatory and inhibitory. Uh, the important difference is that the effect of spiking in a presynaptic cell can either cause more or less spiking in the postsynaptic cell. And intelligent behavior, people like you and me, are thought to arise by complex, very complex interactions of spiking events in very large networks. Now, there are a lot of different computational theories that can explain various specific tasks, such as memory, visual classification, decision making, so on but we don't have enough real data to confirm that our actual brains follow any specific theory. And a big part of this is because in the past we've only been able to record from a handful of neurons simultaneously at a time. Uh, but recently, and this has been developing almost analogous to Moore's Law, every few years we find a way to record from twice as many neurons as before, uh, in recent years, we have developed techniques that can record from hundreds, thousands. I think now they're starting to push tens of thousands. And we're going to focus on one in particular, a method called calcium imaging. Now, in calcium imaging, you have a central laser hub that is scanning, scanning some cubic volume of neural space. And via a whole bunch of uh, post-processing uh, machine learning based techniques, you can identify the location in space of every individual neuron, and then you can extract a measure of fluorescence that indicates how active an individual neuron is. And this is actual real data you're looking at here. And you can see some neurons are spiking very frequently. That's like that one that's always colored. Uh, some aren't spiking at all, and others are going very sporadically according to uh, Poisson processes. And so in the context of the data, what does it look like? It looks like a bunch of calcium, uh, sorry, it looks like a bunch of Gaussian processes. Um, you get traces of relative fluorescence for every pixel in the space. Ease of use typically implies a compromise of high performance. The Leica Acoustal Optical Beam Splitter. Changes. So sorry about that. YouTube automatically loaded the next thing uh, that followed that video. So uh, my goal here is to look at these traces as Gaussian processes and to try to guess which neurons are connected to one another. Uh, and we can statistically model this data in a number of different ways. We can use stochastic differential equations, the linear dynamical systems we talked about in class, uh, general autoregressive processes, or any sort of time series model. And uh, since we're trying to go a little faster today, I probably won't talk too much about the GLM models. Okay, so in the context of everything we're going to talk about today, we're always going to be referencing an adjacency matrix or our probabilistic graphical model shown by this network. Now, it is decomposable into two distinct parts. It has a weighted part that is random and normally distributed. And it has a sparse structure given by what's called Erdős-Rényi, which just means it's random binary at some level of sparsity. So this is an example adjacency matrix. And remember, it's blockwise because we have excitatory and inhibitory neurons. 
uh, in our model. And here you can see the inhibitory ones always have negative weights. So you have random weighting and sparse structure on top of that. And explicitly stating the problem, we're interested in inferring the sparse structure, omega, or the undirected case of omega plus omega transpose. And a quick note uh, on this topic before we go on. Uh, stability is a very important issue with these networks, and you need a very specific set of constraints to guarantee that your system is always stable. And you do that by applying a 1 over square root n scaling on the normally distributed synaptic strength. That constrains the vast majority of the eigenvalues to the unit circle. And, but then you'll notice you have these two big eigenvalues that are conjugate pairs. Uh, those are related to the erdos renyi structure, the sparsity. And those you can keep to the right um, simply by these two jury conditions, uh, the determinant and the trace, on the blockwise average for the network. And throughout this, we're going to be quantifying the performance of various algorithms using ROC analysis. Now, whether this is your first time seeing it or you just need a little refresher, uh, the ROC curve is a parametric function of false positive rate versus true positive rate as the threshold of a linear classifier is varied. And so this is an example ROC curve for some stuff we're going to talk about in just a bit. Um, and you can see you get very high true positives for very low false positives. Uh, but overall, we will often be interested only in the area under this curve, which is a nice bounded measure between one half and one corresponding to just random guessing and perfect classification, respectively. Okay, so the first model we'll talk briefly about is the stochastic differential equation, which is a wilson cowan rate model, uh, which can be expressed as this. Ex, uh, equation in terms of the stochastic differential, uh, the white noise, which is just the differential of the Wiener pro process. Uh, but if you just back up and look at it, it's really just an AR1 process in continuous time. So we know how to deal with this. Um, and you know, the most useful thing that we will use this equation for is the fact that it has analytical solutions to stuff like the cross, cross covariance and in particular the cross spectrum, which is the Fourier transform of that. Uh, the specific algebraic form of the zero frequency cross spectrum can be explicitly expanded to give a one-to-one -one relationship between bidirectional connectivity and precision. So this is kind of like in uh, analogous to all the stuff we talked about with Gaussian graphical models, except this is a process that's varying in time. And so you can equivalently express this AR1 process uh, in discretized form as an LDS that we've seen a lot of throughout this class. And there are a lot of different sub-problems related to sub-ideal observations. Uh, you can have more observations than neurons in the model. That's a great problem to have because then you have multiple samples from every neuron. Uh, but it's often not the case. Oftentimes you have fewer observations than you do neurons. In which case, you pretty much have to shift the entire argument uh, around not talking about inferring single neuron connectivity, but rather connectivity between multiple neurons local in space. Um, another really hard problem is you can have different numbers of observations throughout time. Whenever you apply calcium imaging, you're applying it to a live subject. And so they are um, sometimes anesthetized to try to minimize movement. But there's always a little bit of jitter, um, a little bit of movement. And so you always have to be able to try to identify the set of neurons that you are somehow recording from constantly throughout time and splice together all the data samples from that. Uh, but my focus today is on a more fundamental difficulty. So just for simplicity, let's assume we have near-perfect observations for the LDS. So what do we do when we have a linear dynamical system? Well, the best way to get inference of parameters is expectation maximization, right? You run the common filtering and smoothing by message passing, and then you iterate the EM algorithm on some initial guesses, and after a few iterations, it'll converge. And this is an example application of it. Uh, you see a true network uh, there up on the left, and then you have an estimate given at a fixed false positive ratio. So this estimate of the network was chosen to be right about there on the ROC curve. 
shows it there to have a similar level of sparsity and a fairly high degree of confidence that the selected edges are in fact true edges. Um, but the most important thing here is the fact that the area under the ROC curve monotonically increases as you feed it more and more data. And here we're on the scale of tens to hundreds of thousands of data samples. That will become very important in just a second. And you can also see that it converges to a perfect uh, classifier for these simple networks. Now, why is this? We know that if we just have a GGM, just a standard time invariant uh, graph, we can explicitly get a set of uh, conditional independencies from the precision matrix. We know that. But the precision matrix is just one type of a general idea that's called partial correlation. And partial correlations are really just pairwise correlations conditioned on some set of the network. And precision is, in fact, the largest type of partial correlation in the sense that you condition on everything else in the network besides the pair that you're looking at. But expectation maximization can also be viewed as a type of partial correlation. If you look at the values we derived in homework five, plug in the uh, equivalent common estimates, you can see you have quantities that are essentially proportional to uh, the zero lag sample precision being projected in the direction of the lag one cross covariance. Because remember, EM gives us a directed measure, whereas precision is a symmetric value. You have to impose some sort of directionality in some way. And there are a lot of other different methods. But I thought that was kind of interesting that EM is really just a special case of partial correlation. OK, uh, but before we talk about directly estimating the precision instead of doing the common stuff, uh, a big issue with empirical data is you have very short duration of trials, uh, typically on the order of seconds to minutes, if that. Whereas the plots that I was just showing you, where expectation maximization converged to a really good area under the ROC curve, you needed hundreds of thousands of data samples. That would equate to having you know, trials that lasted for several hours. Now, that's just impractical. No living subject wants to sit there and watch a movie for three hours. These are typically mice that we deal with. Um, so we have very little data. And so to make better use of what little data we have, we will use the buzzword of regularization. And from a Bayesian perspective, regularization is really just like applying a prior distribution to the coefficients for some regression model. And constraining the model in that way really makes better use of what data you have. They, it gives you a higher quality estimate for uh, comparable amounts of data. And so the specific estimation approach for precision that I will use is graphical lasso, a very popular approach, very popular algorithm. And it's the solution of this optimization equation, where you'll notice here we're using an L1 norm on our regularization. That is kind of like um, imposing a sparse prior on our precision matrix. Um, and the regularization strength lambda can be chosen in a number of different ways. Uh, the simplest way is to cross-validate it against target levels of sparsity. The far more interesting approach is to use something called the STARS algorithm, which uses all sorts of measures like uh, AIC, BIC, sports based criterion. And it runs all of these through various iterations to kind of produce a target level of expected sparsity. And so if you apply graphical lasso in combination with a number of other measures, you'll notice that by far, it always surpasses every other measure for inference of structure in these types of networks. And here, notice the difference in the scale of t. Previously, we were talking about tens, hundreds of thousands of data points. Now we're talking about hundreds, which is why our you know, it recovery isn't that great. But the point is still that Glasso does a far better job than any other algorithm, including the naive estimate of precision, which is just the inverse of sample covariance. OK, but there's a big re unrealistic assumption that we've made uh, throughout all the models so far, and that's a lack of external input. Now, in, in empirical studies, you never have observations of these things. 
And so they take on the role of latent variables, which makes them very difficult to deal with. And the way to interpret uh, the external inputs is typically in Cortex, you have multiple recurrent layers where one projects feed forward, uh, offers feed forward projections onto the other. And typically it's only excitatory neurons that do that as well. So they take on the role of latent variables. And so you can update the FCEs and transition models as follows. You add a mean drive from some external adjacency matrix that's very similar in structure to the recurrent, but uh, typically rectangular, because you typically have more or less number of neurons. And then you also now have correlated noise terms, uh, where B is the Cholesky decomposition of the external covariance matrix gamma. And so there's been some proposals in the literature that you can at least in the case of low rank external input where you just have a handful of neurons in the external population there there's been proposed that you can use Gaussian process factor analysis uh, to fit those latent dimensions and that should improve your estimate unfortunately I tried and tried and tried to get this to work unfortunately it appears as if using GPFA overfits the process if it's not only the latent variables but some of the valuable information from the stochastic process itself. And so here you can see Glasso used on the residuals uh, before and after an application of GPFA, and the overfitting from GPFA causes it to uh, decay a, a little lower. It's also a very, very slow algorithm for larger networks. Um, so it's not considered practical currently. Okay, um, a quick note. The problem, at least, of having a mean constant drive can be solved in the context of a linear dynamical system. This is a uh, homework problem in Bishop's Machine Learning book, uh, section 13. Basically, you just add some additional rows to your uh, hidden states, fix them at unity. Now you can absorb additional columns as the mean input uh, onto your new network W. And that just shifts the whole problem, but your old EM estimates would still be perfectly fine. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't appear to work either, and we'll explain why in just a second. Here we're back to the level where we have tens of thousands of data samples, so they should be doing better, right? But they're not. This is in the presence of external input acting as latent variables. And so why is not a single measure giving us good inference? It's because we are now receiving biased external input covariance that in fact shares terms with the mean input drive. So at least for expectation maximization, you have to completely redo the end step. Now I've tried to do this analytically. Unfortunately, there's one specific part uh, that is essentially intractable. And so you would need to implement generalized EM to approximate a local solution. Uh, but more generally, none of the other measures work well either. Sample precision, uh, covariance, even the AR fit, none of them did a good job because they're all somehow functions of the precision for this process, which in the presence of an external input takes on the following form, where you have additive terms going from the external input covariance and remember, this is the part that gave us the one-to-one -one relationship with bidirectional network connectivity. It's now being scrambled, projected in all sorts of different directions by the external input covariance, and you're also getting more variability from the uh, triple product term. So it's just not a good problem. And then, yeah, I decided we decided to skip this since we're going a little faster today. Um, Quick plug, uh, my collaborators on a lot of this research at Rice University down in Houston uh, is headed by the lab of Ginevra Allen. Uh, they're exploring a couple other cases of time dependence, which are really interesting, but I don't have time to uh, talk about. She also has an upcoming talk next Friday, uh, May 4th. That's a part of the ACMS colloquium, but I think it's sponsored by IBM. Uh, you should really go if you're interested in dealing with high dimensional data. She does a lot of other projects in uh, biostatistics, not just neuroscience. And so here are many other references that a lot of this is based on. Uh, the first two were 
uh, kind of joint publications by Alan, and this is just a general background on the problem in general, and since we didn't talk about GLMs, if you want to learn more about what GLMs can offer, uh, any publication has Pillow Lab is the way to go. Uh, this work is supported under multiple NSF grants, and I'd like to thank everyone in the Rosenbaum Lab for their feedback on the early versions of this presentation. Uh, so thank you for listening, and do you have any questions? Okay, so everything, uh, he asked how many neurons do I look at? So I've looked at data sets containing hundreds, um, but everything you saw in this presentation had uh, was 30. So very small network. Now I have looked at hundreds and thousands uh, of, neuron, of neurons in the context of in silico modeling. Uh, and you, the only thing is it's harder to get really clear results to show you. Uh, you can crank up the data that you feed the model to really like millions of data points, and that's what's required to get really good inference for like, you know, a thousand neurons or something like that. So yeah, I look at fairly small networks in this context. But the goal is to develop methods. A part of the reason there is computational time. Um, Glasso doesn't even converge if you have more than a few hundred neurons. There's a certain step in the lasso algorithm where you have to do a kind of shooting thing, and it just it takes forever to not converge if you have a few hundred neurons and very small amounts of data. But the hope is to one day extend all of our methods to the case where we can look at tens of thousands simultaneously and still perform this level of inference. We're just not there yet. Good question. Any others? All right, thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. My talk is about wavelet-based pre-structured compressive sensing with variational Bayesian analysis. So a wavelet-based transform can be used to uh, decompose a given signal or function that we have in terms of some basis functions called wavelets. And then we can study these, uh, uh, the structure of these uh, wavelet coefficients of the typical data that we have. So imagine that we have a signal and we apply wavelet decomposition on this. The results are two types of data. One is the scaling coefficients, the other ones are the uh, wavelet coefficients. Scaling coefficients give an approximation of the function that we have in some lower resolution space, and the wavelet coefficients provides us with the details that we need to uh, reconstruct the original data that we have from those, that approximation. Now, we can apply the wavelet decomposition as many a times as we want. And each time we need to take the approximation that we have, apply decomposition on that, and then we end up with another set of uh, wavelet coefficients and uh, even lower resolution of the approximation. So to reconstruct the data, we can take the um, we can take these uh, scaling coefficients and sum them with the wavelet coefficients that we have for all the levels of the, the decomposition and we reconstruct our uh, original data. So 
For most signals, the wavelet coefficients are sparse and they're compressible. And that means that we can set to zero many of the wavelet coefficients that we have. Many of them have a negligible value and we can neglect them. And we can uh, reconstruct the function from the modified wavelet uh, coefficients and end up with a good, uh, uh, basically, accuracy. But this might look wasteful because the measurements that we have might not, might not always be uh, easy and cheap to acquire. For example, in MRI image, uh, imaging, it's a very tedious task and it's time consuming. Uh, or, for example, hyperspectral imaging, it's, uh, we need to take images in many spectral bands. So, one might think that it's a useful way to uh, only measure the informative parts of data and uh, reduce the number of measurements that we need to have. This leads to the uh, idea of compressible sensing. So in compressible sensing, we assume that the signal we have is compressible in some basis, and then we can uh, exactly reconstruct the original, our underlying original signal with a number of appropriately designed projected measurements. They assume that the uh, CS measurements that we have are uh, V, and this V can be, uh, is equal to C times theta, where theta is our wavelet coefficients, and uh, C is the matrix, rows of which are the uh, randomly defined projected projection vectors. So we would like, if uh, we assume that this V is n dimension, n uh, basically 1 times n, n dimensions, uh, n elements, and theta is, has m elements, we would like the number of measurements to be as low as possible uh, relative to number of uh, coefficients that we have. So uh, we would like for m to be n to be as, as small or as possible than n. If we have the theta coefficients, we can reconstruct our image or signal that we have by using an inverse transform. But what we measure are not the thetas themselves, is it is a projection. It is a projection of those uh, thetas. And then we must infer theta from our measurements. All right. So because the uh, because n is as small or as possible that m, uh, this problem is underdetermined and it's ill-posed. And a good way to uh, approach this problem is using Bayesian CS inversion. Uh, and so wavelets have some structures, and we can incorporate the structure of these wavelets to wavelet coefficients to in order to reduce the number of required measurements that we have. If we want to apply a discrete wavelet transform on a sig given signal, we can define this as applying a series of high-pass and low-pass uh, uh, filters. And that would result in a crop tree. Here, H stands for the high-pass and L stands for low-pass. We have a signal, we apply this, we end up with two sets of results. Again. On each of these, we apply these two uh, high band and low band filters. At the end, we end up with three sub bands of wavelet coefficients. If this one is the uh, details in the uh, horizontal direction, vertical direction, and diagonal direction. And this part is the scaling coefficients that we have, which gives us the approximation in the lower space. Now, this can again be decomposed. Again, some wavelets coefficients and uh, some scaling coefficients and again and again until it's possible. So the number of times that we apply the wavelet decomposition is called the depth of our uh, decomposition. This is called a quad tree. Uh, this uh, structure is called a quad tree and we would like to incorporate the knowledge of this to uh, basically uh, into the prior of our model. A tree structure has a few uh, definitions and properties. The uh, s equals zero contains our scaling coefficients. 
S all other ones contain our wavelet coefficients. S equal one is the root node. The last one is the leaf node. There is also a parent-child relationship between the wavelet coefficients across the scales. Each wavelet coefficient is parent for four wavelet coefficients in the scale S plus one. Now, uh, until the uh, last, basically, scaling. Now, here, this wavelet coefficient is for, uh, parent for four children. And each of these have four other children until leaf node. So, the, uh, in compressive sensing, as I said, we would like to uh, use this structure that we have and incorporate it in the prior in order to reduce the number of measurements that are required for a uh, uh, basically a good accuracy reconstruction of the signal. This has been previously used in other fields like compressing, uh, compressing data or uh, texture synthesis or image denoising. And here we would like to take this, uh, the exploit the structure of these wavelet quad trees and use them in our Bayesian inversion. One thing about the wavelet coefficients is that the negligible wavelet coefficients tend to cluster together. And they, uh, so if a parent is a uh, negligible coefficient, its children with high probability would be uh, negligible as well. So, so they uh, basically start to make zero trees. It means that a parent is zero, children is zero, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, we can uh, describe the statistics of this structure using hidden Markov trees. In hidden Markov trees, we can say that, all right, so we have two types of coefficients. One are negligible coefficients, the other type are the significant coefficients. We can draw the co uh, negligible coefficients from a Gaussian with a low variance, and we can draw the uh, coefficient, significant coefficients from a Gaussian with a uh, larger variance. And uh, to define this parent-child -child relationship, we can uh, use a uh, Markov representation across the scales. So this Markov transition can be defined using a, a two by two matrix PIJ, where I stands for the state of the parent, J stands for the state of the child. So PIJ, for example, P low low, is the probability of child and parent both being in the low state, which is a high probability. So we show it with one minus epsilon, epsilon being a small uh, positive number. So this imposes the belief that if parents' coefficients is negligible, its children would be negligible as well. But there is, <coughs> uh, but in the hidden mark of tree, we are assuming that our observations are our uh, theta, our wavelet coefficients. But in uh, compressive sensing, our measurements are the uh, random projections of these wavelet coefficients, and we don't. Uh, observe these coefficients directively. D directly. All right. So, assuming our signal is called X, we and uh, we have a uh, match ba basically wavelet uh, decomposition matri matrix psi. We apply this and we get our wavelet coefficients, and our measurements are random projections of the uh, wavelet coefficients that we have. We can divide this into two groups, theta m, which includes the significant coefficients, uh, but the negligible ones are set to zero. And the other one is theta e, where the significant ones are set to zero, and it only has the negligible ones. And uh, we also assume that we have noise in our measurements. So we can sum these two up and write them as n, which is a noise, and it can be it is represented with a Gaussian with some precision uh, alpha. And this alpha is to be inferred from the CS inversion. 
So what we would like to find is the, uh, the significant wavelet coefficient. First, their locations. Second, their values. And uh, so the posterior distribution of these uh, would be inferred using the observed data, the CS measurements we. Now, the structural, the structural information that we would like to incorporate in the prior are two things. First, parent-child relationship. Second one, the sparseness of the wavelet coefficient. One can define it using this Python slab prior, which is a uh, combined distribution, a mixture, uh, combined distribution, which is a uh, delta here is a uh, mass point and uh, centered on zero, and n is a Gaussian. So we are saying that our relative coefficients are drawn from a, are either zero with probability one minus pi i, or they are drawn from a Gaussian distribution with some variance with probability pi. Okay, so this first part represents the uh, zero coefficients, and this part represents the significant non-zero coefficients. So each of these uh, corresponds with one of the Gaussians that we, define, uh, we were talking about in the hidden Markov tree. And uh, the difference is that here, the coefficients in the low state are explicitly set to zero as opposed to hidden Markov tree model, which is what it was drawn from a Gaussian with low uh, variance. Now, we, we can impose the belief that if parents are zero, their children would be zero using uh, some, depend some dependencies across uh, on the mixing weight across the different scales. Now, we can rewrite this slab and spike, uh, spike and slab prior in terms of uh, using Hadamard product, which is basically element-wise product. We have W, theta equals W times Z. W is the uh, coefficients drawn from a uh, Gaussian distribution, and Z is a Bernoulli distribution, which is one or zero. It gives us the, uh, one says that, okay, the wavelet coefficient is in a high state, and zero says that it's in low state, and sets that to zero. And the, our, in our model, we would like to find these mixing weights, the precision parameter, and precision for the noise. We can summarize the model as following. We have our theta. It is a product of W and Z, where W is valid coefficients from, from a Gaussian distribution. Z is uh, de defining whether they are in high or low uh, state. And it's a Bernoulli distribution. And pi's are the uh, our basically mixing, uh, mixing weights. Now, we can divide the types of mixing weight into four categories. One is the mixing weight for the scaling coefficient. Second one is the mixing weight for the root nodes. And uh, third one is the mixing weight for the uh, all other wavelet coefficients that have non-zero, uh, basically, parents. And lastly is the ones that have zero parents. Each of these are uh, defined using some hyperparameters, which uh, we would like to, by choosing these hyperparameters, we would like to say, OK, what uh, idea we have about this, uh, uh, basically, each of these subbands for uh, coefficients in the scaling, for the scaling coefficients, so they are normally non zero. And for the so we would like uh, something clustered around one. And for the root nodes also, uh, we would like the same type of distribution. For the ones that have zero parents, we would like them to be clustered around zero. And for the other ones we, uh, that have non-zero parents, we don't impose any prior information. We, uh, they can be anything. Here is a graphical representation of the problem, of the model. 
uh, see these are the hy hyperparameters that we have. With these hyperparameters are used basically to define the mixing weights, and these are for defining the uh, precisions. And V is our observation here. So I described these two slides on a formulation slide. All right. So the posterior distribution parameter here is theta. And this is inferred using the observed data from our CS measurements. And can, we can find the posterior distribution for this using some method like uh, variational Bayesian method or uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. In a uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo gives a more accurate solution. And it is basically computationally uh, uh, very expensive. On the other hand, variational base give us a uh, some uh, good approximation to the solution, and it's fast and it has convergence uh, criterion defined. So, in a variational base, we have sets of distribution Q theta, which approximate the true posterior, and we have some lower bound F, which approximates the log, true log likelihood, and we do iterations until our lower bound approaches the true log likelihood. Uh, I have uh, three test cases here, and the difference between them is the, number, uh, the size of them and the number of measurements. For wavelet decomposition, I have used Dupcher wavelet, DB1, and the relative reconstruction error is uh, calculating using, calculated using this. All right. So here is the first image. It's a 128 by 128 uh, pixel image, and 7,000 measurements have been used. Uh, Reconst basically uh, it's decomposed, and then the sparse coefficients are reconstructed, and the image is recovered. And this is the relative error. Second image is 64 by 64 test image, and uh, 2,500 measurements have been used for this test. And the last one is a 32 by 32 image, uh, which uh, has been uh, decomposed using the Chev wavelets, reconstructed, and then uh, you, this is the error. And uh, we have used 600 measurements for this. All right, these are the uh, references. And uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Hello all, this is Tina and I'm doing my presentation on the uh, pairwise choice Markov chain. Uh, actually, I will reproduce a paper by the group in the Stanford University working on this new model. They published it in the next conference in 2016, uh, which is a novel model in the choice model, discrete choice model, and uh, they are developing it now with uh, different universities in California, uh, Caltech, UC Berkeley, Stanford University, and USC. Uh, <coughs> actually, I want to, first of all, to, I want to bring a motivation about the, the choice models, actually the, uh, growing the data sets, uh, capturing the uh, choice, uh, capturing the human choices, 
uh, in, in scale and richness, this is the some motivation and some uh, cause for the uh, increasement of the uh, uh, choice models in order to uh, escape from the traditional choice theory uh, axioms, for example, regularity or stochastic uh, transitivity and uh, Lucius choice axiom. So um, I want to. This was the motivation for introducing this model, pairwise choice macro chain PCMC model. Uh, it is inferential, inferential tractable model, and it does not assume the mentioned axiom, traditional axiom, and it is satisfying the foundation of uh, uh, axiom of uniform, uniform expansion. So. Uh, these discrete choice models uh, describe and actually predict the uh, decision between distinct uh, the alternatives and the applications or the consumer purchasing decisions and commuter choices mode for transportation among available uh, options. So there is a pressing need for flexible models capable of these describing and predicting the uh, choice behaviors. <clears throat> so, um, one of the one of the very uh, actually arguably one one of the uh, most important of these axioms to uh, our Lucius choice axiom, which is known as the independence of relevant alternatives. Uh, so, if for example we apply this axiom on the subset of alternatives S within it broader universe U, we want to define some probabilities. Let PAS be the probability of A chosen from the uh, set S uh, within a, uh, as the S is a subset of U, and PAB is the probability of chosen A, uh, A chosen from the set AB when, for example, we have two uh, elements. <coughs> there are two important uh, statements in this axiom. If PAV is equal to zero, then PAS will be zero for all S containing A and B. The probability of choosing A from U condition on the choice line in S is equal to PAS. So another another uh, model is the Bradley Terry loose model. Uh, actually, this this model I I referred it. Uh, it was some idea about the rank blocking in the pair comparison. So it has been published in uh, 1956. It actually defines the PAV as gamma I over gamma A plus gamma B for latent quality parameters gamma I. Uh, and the resulting uh, multinominal logit model uh, employs co this quality parameter gamma I for each I as the member of U. So uh, any model that satisfies the Lucius axiom is equivalent to this uh, MNN model. So one consequence, uh, actually I, I'm t talking about the different models, traditional models and the consequences, and then I want to reach the PCMC and to say that PCMC is doing a better job and a great job in comparison to the traditional choice model. Uh, one consequence of this Lucius axiom model is a strict stochastic transitivity between alternatives. Transitivity means, for example, we have uh, three elements. We have an A has a connection with B, B with C. We can say that there is, there is a, a, a relation between A and C alternatives. So if the probability of uh, PAB is greater than or equal to one half, and also this for B, then PAC is equal to or greater than uh, the maximum of PAB and BC. A broad, important class of models in a study of this discrete choice is the class of uh, RULMs or random utility models. Uh, it aggregates with each I as a member of the broader universe U and a, a random variable XI. And it, it defines the probability of i chosen from s as this expression probability of xi greater than 
or equal to xj for any j as the number of s all uns assume neither choice axiom nor stochastic um, transitivity um, so now the pcmc model uh, it is computationally simple uh, conceptually and computationally simple and inferentially tractable model there are some parameters we have some parameters uh, in this model the off diagonal introduced qij of a rate matrix q indexed by u uh, and also it, dis it defines the pis the selection probability of alternatives as the probability mass of the alternative i of the stationary distribution of the continuous prime markov chain uh, the, the stationary distribution, actually the stationary distribution in the Markov chain is the probability which can be uh, shown with the vector pi and the, in this vector we have some probability distribution coming to one and if, if you multiply the um, pi transpose uh, to the Q which is the rate matrix you get the, you get the pi so <coughs> Uh, the stationary distribution of the chain is to found to satisfy the uh, stationary condition of the MNL likelihood function and establishing a strong connection between MNL model and Markov chain. So the PCMC model generalizes this connection between MNL and Markov chain. Uh, this is this is the schema. The, the left side is the schematic view of the Markov chains for choices A and B, B and C and A and C and those arrows, the thickness of those arrows are the uh, rate the, the rate of our transition. The right side uh, is the assembly of these exactly these choices in the this three shape uh, triangle shape with the same uh, transition rates. So we, we define some, actually impose the, some constraint here, which is um, QIJ plus, plus QJI is equal to uh, greater than one for all pairs IJ, which is the irreducibility. Uh, ensures the irreducibility in our model. So given a set S as the member, as a subset of U, we want to know if we can construct the QS. Construct QS by restricting, we can do that by restricting the rows and columns of Q uh, to elements in set and set uh, the QII as this expression and P pi of S is this which is the stationary distribution of the continuous time Markov chain so defining the choice probability PIS which is equal to pi S of I we now want to show that the PCMC model is well defined. So, proposition one, we want to show that the, these choice probabilities are well defined for the i as the member of s and all of the s as subset of u. <clears throat> this is some sort of problem that, in order to prove it, we we need to assume something against the target that we want to prove and continue with it, and then you reach some contra contradiction. So. In order to prove that this is well defined, I need to show that it's, there is just only one closed communication class. We know that the S is finite, so there must be only just one closed communication class here. So I, I, I assume that there is more than one closed communication class, but I know that based on the irreducibility, the, the uh, constraint of imposing the irreducibility, I know that QIJ plus QJI is greater than or equal to one. And so at least one of these QIJ or QJI sh should be strictly positive. And this implies that uh, there, is, there is some switching between communication classes. And so this is, and this has, this would be done through the transition strictly positively, which is a contradictory. And some notes here is that uh, for the irreducibility argument, uh, this expression should be positive, not necessarily one, as I, as we brought in the proof of our proposition. So, 
So it could be uh, some constraint like this, and for some positive epsilon, uh, and we can multiply by the one over epsilon as a constant, and it does not affect our stationary distribution. Proposition two: Let gamma be the parameter of a uh, BTL model in U for QIJ equal to gamma I over gamma I plus gamma J, PCMC probabilities PIS are consistent with an MNL model. Uh, so we want to show that pi of S is equal to gamma over the Manhattan norm of the gamma, which is the summation of the gamma I, gamma I for I equal to 1 to N. So we want to show that uh, sorry we want to show that that pi is the station distribution of the PCMC chain but I, I, will, I want to reach uh, that PS transfer QID is equal to zero so for, for this uh, expression I have this one so we can pull out this lambda i and so we know the values of QJI QJI as here so this is equal to zero. Thus, pi i x is always the stationary distribution of the chain. Uh, now I want to talk about some properties of this PCMC. Uh, we want to demonstrate that PCMC exhibits this structure of the form contractibility, uh, which implies uniform expansion. So. Uh, for the uniform expansion, we should talk about two definitions. First of all, the, it is the first of all, it is uh, the uh, definition of the copies. For i and j in S as a subset of u, we say that uh, i and j are copies with each other if for all k as the number of S minus i minus j, we have uh, these two expressions. So, we consider an upper of, for example, choice of beverage for K identical cups of coffee, K identical cups of tea, and K identical glasses of milk. So we say this, con this contends that uh, the probability that the reader chooses a type of beverage uh, in this, this scenario, it is the same as if they were shown just only one cup of some sort of, for example, uh, the beverage. Uh, and regardless of the, the values of k, k equal to or greater than 1. Definition 2 is the uniform expansion. We consider a choice between an element in a set S1 from I11 to IN1 and another choice from a set SK containing k copies of each of those n, n elements. The axiom of uniform expansion states that for each m and all k greater than or equal to 1, we have this expression. So, we conclude that PCMC model always exhibits a more general property of contractibility, uh, which it always exhibits uniform expansion. Uh, so, we, I want to uh, here bring the uh, Proposition 3 for a given gamma, which is the lambda ij, let a1 to ak be a contractible partition for two PCMT models on U, uh, represented by q and q prime, with a station distribution pi and pi prime. Then for any ai, we have this expression or equivalently we say that pi ai is equal to pi prime ai. Uh, so for the proof, uh, we suppose that Q has partition A1 to AK with respect to uh, gamma. If it decompose the balanced equation, each row of the P transfer Q, which is equal to zero. For X uh, member of A1, without loss of generality, we can obtain uh, this expression. So uh, here, uh, noting that for the a small a i a j as the member of capital a i and j and the q i a i a j is equal to lambda i j uh, here we can uh, we can actually decompose it multiply pi of x pi of x with each of 
this term in this expression and then summing over x as a member of a1 v, we will reach this uh, this long expression the leftmost side terms of each side is equal so this one and this one so, so we have we can get the pa1 which uh, which makes the pi, pi, pi A1 as the solution of to our uh, mm, balanced equation. Uh, the above proposition and the contractibility of a PCMC model, so it implies that the PCMC model ex exhibits a uniform expansion. Uh, in the re in inference and prediction part, our uh, ultimate goal is formulating this model to make prediction using past choices from different subsets to predict future choices. Uh, there are three parts, three steps in the in the prediction part, giving the uh, log likelihood function, which is the rate matrix Q given a choice data collection of the form C. Uh, where the IK is the member of SK was the item chosen from SK. Investigating the ability of learned PCMC model to make choice prediction on empirical data benchmark against learned MNL and, and mixed MNL. And then interpreting the uh, inferred model parameters Q hat. For the maximum likelihood, let's define uh, CIS as the number of items, uh, number of times in the data that I was chosen from the set S and also CS as the number of times that S was chosen for each uh, S as the subset of U. So there are two uh, recallings here. For each S, the PIS of Q is the probability uh, for the selection of S as a function of the rate matrix Q. And after dropping all the constants, the log likelihood of Q given the data C, which have been de derived from the probability mass uh, function of the multinomial distribution, which is, and we, we get this uh, expression. And for the, and recalling to is for the PCMC model, uh, we have we, want, we, we have these where pi, pi is is the uh, station distribution for the continuous time Markov chain uh, and uh, actually they have they have used the non tape problem optimization problem and uh, if anyone is interested just for the information I'm saying that they have used the uh, SLSQ programming sequential least square programming in order to optimize them, they use the uh, scipy that minimize a function in the Python, uh, or you can use the minimize uh, the method FLSQP. The, the empirical data results, they evaluate the procedure on two empirical data sets uh, from a survey, trans survey of transportation around the San Francisco Bay Area the San Francisco work is contains uh, 5,029 observations consisting of commuting options and the choice mode on a given community. And S San Francisco shop contains uh, 3,157 observations, each consisting of choice set of transportation alternatives available to individuals traveling and returning from the shopping centers. <coughs> for the training, uh, for training our model on observation T train and evaluate on a test set T test, this is the, the, the error of T train and T test that we want to evaluate, actually compare the PCMC model based on this error with others model, uh, which in, in this expression, the Q hat of T train estimates for Q obtained from the observation of T train and P tilde is t test is equal to cis t test over cs of t test which is the empirical probability of i was selected from s among observation t test so here uh, uh, 
this is uh, actually I uh, I have done it for first of all for S San Francisco work data and uh, at first the number of simulations run is 10 this is the comparison between the error versus the percentage of data used for training from uh, 5 to 75 percent I did 75 percent of the data for training and 25 for the test uh, and PCMC model is doing a great job here in, in comparison to ML, MNL and mixed MNL and these are the, the heat maps for the for the probability uh, for for each side actually the hor um, horizontal and the vertical we have six we have six pairs of the options uh, which are driving alone uh, and sharing a ride with one another person walking public transit biking and carpooling with at least two others and we are showing the probability of these relative rates rate, uh, between pairs of items as well as how the total rate between pairs compares to total rate between other pairs. Uh, here I did the uh, simulation for uh, number of uh, simulation equal to 50. So uh, when we actually, when we increase the number of simulation, it, it will be a little more uh, time consuming. So uh, in the previous one with the 10 simulation, we see here that uh, first of all PCMC model starts with a little more error, but then we increase the, uh, the increase the number of simulation. Uh, they uh, start on some sort of the same uh, error, but after that the PCMC model in comparison to two other models is doing a great job. So in, in, in data with the violations of IIA, that was the that was known for the Lucius choice axiom that I talked about, it, which is the independence relevant of alternatives. PCMT does 20 to 30 percent better at prediction out of sample. Without violations, PCMT falls back to MNF. And this is for uh, San Francisco shop data. Uh, and again, this is for eight of eight uh, actually order options, and the previous one was six. So here again, the uh, PCMT model is, is doing better than two uh, other models. <coughs> so this we can say that error on the data as the learning procedure is applied to increasing amount of data. The results are average over 1,000 different permutations of the data with the 75-25 train and test data. Prediction error on a 25% hold of the data for the PCMC, MNL, and MMM mixed MNL models have been shown. And PCMC models sees improvement of 35.9% uh, and 24.5% in prediction error over MNL and mixed MNL respectively when training on 75% uh, of the data. For the summary, we introduced a pairwise choice Markov chain model of discrete choice, which defines selection properties according to the search and distribution of the continuous time Markov chains. This uh, flexibility for this, this flexibility, we demonstrate that PCMC model exhibits a uh, desirable structure by fulfilling the uniform expansion, a property previously found only in the MNL model, and uh, elimination by aspect model. The work demonstrates that the PCMC model exhibits contra uh, contractibility, which implies uniform expansion. We also show that the PCMC model offers a straightforward inference through MLE, and that the learned PCMC model predicts empirical choice that a bit significantly high fidelity in respect to two other models. For the future work, because this is a very novel idea uh, by the Stanford group, the flexibility and tractability of the PCMT model opens up many compelling research directions. The efficiency of the PCMT model suggests exploring other effective parameterization for Q, the rate matrix, including developing inferential methods which exploit contractibility. 
There are also open computational questions such as streamlining the likelihood maximization using gradients of the implicit uh, function definitions. And these are the references for, for this work. Thank you. Any questions?